this episode, I'll be answering student questions. Uh, I'll be talking about ways to help a horse with a downhill conformation become more balanced, as well as a question about whether short strides are due to a blocked back. And then I'll answer some questions about motivation, how to really motivate your horse to want to do things with enthusiasm, and also a question with how to then use uh, food rewards uh, without your horse mugging you. All right, that is a lot of ground to cover if I want to go in any depth, and I love to go in depth. So let's get going. Here we go. Episode six, Ask Karen Anything. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. I recently asked members of my Dressage Naturally video classroom to send in questions for this episode of the podcast, which is called Ask Karen Anything. Strangely enough, they all sent in questions about horses. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, it is my favorite topic and the subject of this podcast, so I guess it's good we all stayed on topic. <laughs> I thought maybe I was opening myself up for some surprises when I said, ask me anything. All right, let's dig in. I want to start with, um, there's two questions about biomechanics and helping our horses move better. So let me start by playing uh, a question from Daniela. Hello, Karen. This is Daniela. I, my question is, is a short stride due to a contracted blocked back and if yes how can i work on the stride stride length from the ground or and from the saddle thank you all right so you know this is um this is a question that i put in the the category of biomechanics so in my mind i always think big picture is this a horsemanship question a biomechanics question or a gymnastic question. So this is this question I would put in the biomechanics department. You know, how can I get my horse to have a longer stride? Now she asked if it could be due to a blocked back. And yes, it very well could be due to a blocked back. Um, and this is a great question to be asking because we're looking at a horse in front of our in front of us and going, <laughs> you know, here's what I see here's where I want it to go, and how do we get there? So I always like to ask people, you know, if you were to make a list of all the possible reasons why your horse might be having a short stride, or if we guess that maybe it's a blocked back, you know, what are all the reasons why they might not be moving as freely and scopy as possible? And you know, those of you listening probably are having things pop in your head right now. So <laughs> the list is long of all the things that could be getting in the way or creating or causing your horse to have a shorter stride. Now, um, some horses are just, that's just how they, how they move. It's, you know, I'm not very flexible <laughs> compared to, you know, some people. And yes, I could develop it, but sometimes it's just the nature of how they move. So I think it's really good to think about it in these terms of, is there something actively, it's what I call active unhealthy biomechanics, there's something actively getting in the way that if I remove that blockage, now they'll be free, or are they that length of a stride? Because that's the length of their stride for different reasons of just confirmation or just how they are? Um, and do I need to amplify and do exercises to increase the scope and increase um, the range of motion? So 
in in general, I like Danielle's question because I'll always go first to removing what might be in the way. So I think that's a good rule of thumb is get rid of the things that are actively getting in the way. And again, that list is long. The the way their feet are trimmed, the way their tack fits, um, are they in fear? Are they bored? Is the rider unbalanced? You know, do they have ulcers? Are they in pain? Are they a long, long list of things? So take some time to step back and look at all the things that possibly could be actively getting in the way. Are they standing in the stall 23 hours a day? You know, whatever it is. I'll leave you to that. We can't go through each one. Um, but with that said, um, creating fr free moving loose top line is really important. It's one of the most important things I teach. And actually, this is great timing that I had two people sending questions around this. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast right when it first comes out, um, just know that my course called Finding the Sweet Spot of Healthy Biomechanics opens up, we open up twice a year. And so we open it up in September for an October start date. And also again in March for an April start date. So this is perfect timing for these questions. Um, if you guys are intrigued by how I answer these questions or want more help in doing the things I talk about, um, go to my website, dressagenaturally.net, look for online programs. There's a tab in the top menu and then scroll down and look for the sweet spot of healthy biomechanics course and take a look because it's a highly supported course. You get to talk to me and my coaches once a week. We do video coaching that's included in the course. So um, we go really deep dive over a six month period um, of that kind of support. So I just want you guys to know that that resource is available. So if you like how I answer and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> I need more help. Um, that that's how, <laughs> that there is more help. Okay. So um, we want to, if we, well, let's say that we've removed the obvious blocks, you know, we've removed um, obvious fear, right? Fear can cause contraction. We, the saddle fits, the feet look good. They're healthy. They're motivated. You know, that's a big endeavor right there. But let's say we've removed the obvious things. You're like, no, this is a nice, happy horse. And they just move kind of short. Um, and we want to increase the scope of the horse's stride. Then yes, I would be thinking about the horse's top line. And we want to add to that horse um, stretchability, engagement, and straightness. So those are sort of gymnastic um, things. You could do cavalettis, you know, that's sort of a easy first go-to thing is you set up cavalettis and, you know, match them to your horse's stride and then progressively, incrementally stretch them out, <laughs> you know, and go through a gymnastic exercise of helping the horse increase their scope. But from a biomechanical point of view, we need to find what I call the sweet spot first. We can, if we do gymnastic exercises with a horse that's actively tight in their back, it's just going to, it might even cause more pain and more shortening. So I think of a free swinging loose back is really connected to a posture of trust. So it's not a frame, it's not a position, we're not going to put side reins on to get the horse's head down for their back to come up. I think of the stretch as a result of balance, and the balance is a result of movement. The movement is a result of the communication that we use to ask for that movement, and the communication is a result of the partnership. And that's what I mean by a free swinging back is a posture of trust. And if you're not sure what I mean by that, think of the opposite of that. How many times have you seen horses that the riders are, or the trainers are trying to get the horses back up? So they have draw reins, martingales, side reins that put the head down, which might give the illusion that the back is higher. And then they're whacking the horse to go all in the name of trying to create a round posture. Like, and, the, and you, you look at that and you guys know, it's like, that's crazy. <laughs> like that is not creating 
freedom of movement. It's just creating a shape, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to do the opposite of that and, and have the horse find a place where the horse says, Ooh, I can move easier here. And that category of exercise is what I call finding the sweet spot. It's not gymnastic yet. We want to be in this posture of the horse going, Ooh, I feel really nice and free. And in that state, we do gymnastic exercises. So the whole sweet spot concept is that for every horse on every day, there's a certain amount, certain combination of relaxation, energy, and balance where you're going to notice that the horse moves, fill in the blank, whatever adjectives you're looking for, a little bit more. So for Daniela, she's focusing on, um, or she's noticed length of stride. She's like, my horse moves a little bit of a short stride. I wonder if the back is locked. Well, maybe. <laughs> so here's what I do. I, I take a guess, but I go, all right, if I want to improve how this horse moves, I know I need to be able to talk to the horse about calmness, right? A degree of relaxation, right? Because fear, anxiety, confusion causes contraction or at least bad posture, right? So talk to your, be able to talk to your horse about relaxation, be able to talk to your horse about different energy levels. I think we've all experienced sometimes on a nice crisp fall day, our horses suddenly move better, right? Why? Because they're offering more energy. Now we also have seen horses that when they finally lower their energy, now they start to really swing because they're not all this frenetic movement. So we want to develop an ability to ask our horse for a range of energy levels because one of those energy levels might have a huge effect on the length of stride. Now we also want to be able to talk to our horse about balance. And that means as you're going along, whether you're online or you're riding, can you say, hey, can you move your shoulder out for one stride and then leave it alone? I'm not talking about a lateral position, holding it there. I'm just going, could you move over here? Just checking, <laughs> go to neutral. Could you swing the horse's haunches out for a stride? Le leave it alone. Just checking. Could you move the haunches in for a stride? Leave it alone. Just checking. And the idea is that you and your horse are experimenting together. So now developing all those communications is the subject of the sweet spot course. I mean, this takes some time, but I want to give you the idea because some of you might be able to take this idea and run with it. So let's say you can tell your horse to calm down when he needs to calm down. Let's say you can have a huge range of energy levels from sugar foot jog to like wah, exploding. <laughs> and let's say that you can move your horse like a little wiggle worm anywhere you want on demand. So then you have these dials that you can turn. And I think of them like, um, you know, my husband's a musician, or if you played a stereo that has all little knobs, treble, bass, middle, and you can turn the knobs until you get the right sound that you want. So this is, think of relaxation, energy, and balance as three knobs on your equalizer. And you play around, you literally experiment and you go, all right, let's see if I can get my horse a little more enthusiastic, but ask for a slow tempo and move the haunches to the left three times in a row and then see what my horse looks like. Or you could try really high energy, but super calm and try moving the shoulders around a little bit. And I, number one, make sure that those communications work because if they don't work, now you're just poking and giving aids and your horse is like, what, what, and what? <laughs> you know, now he's more confused. So in the sweet spot course, we take a lot of time to isolate we go deep into each of those conversations so that you go, hey, horse, can you move your shoulder? And he goes, sure, like this? Yes, thank you. You know, so you want to get the communication like that. But let's pretend you have that. If you experiment, I promise, 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 this has never not worked. That if you're experimenting and you, you've approached your horse going, I'm going to experiment and look for a moment 
where I see a hint of longer strides. That's, that's the quality you're looking for. You've got your longer strides, antennas out. And if you go play around and you build these communications and you muck around and you turn the, do- the knobs and see, you're going to find a moment where maybe you ask for energy and then you relax a little bit and you move the haunches to the left two strides and then you went to neutral and you're like, oh, those two strides. For two strides, I saw two longer strides. And you go, okay, what did I just do? Let me try that again. Let me get a burst of energy and then I'll calm down. I'll move the haunches to the left two strides. <laughs> and then go to neutral. And I promise you, if you are looking with that kind of focus, you're going to notice some sort of circumstance that you maybe stumble across where you notice the horse's strides were longer than they were before. And then if you're able to remember what you just did, and then you can recreate it, you go, let me do that on purpose again. And now you have a circumstance that you can recreate that causes longer strides. And You're doing this not by standing back and go, is the pole in the correct place? How many tracks are they over tracking? When I look from the back, are they perfectly straight? You're not doing that. You're saying, horse, within your body, and if you're riding them, within your body, while my body is riding you, where do you feel the most free? Right? So you're asking the horse to tell you when he feels like being free. And now I should add in all of this, when you're riding, you've got to put yourself into this experiment too. So you can experiment as a rider with, you know, can you put your more weight in your legs? Can you put your more weight in your seat? Can you slowly twist from one direction to the other? Maybe you need to make an adjustment. How about you sit a little further back? How you sit a little further forward? Can you tip your pelvis a little to six and 12 o'clock and see if that makes a difference. You know, you've got to experiment too. And the more you experiment, the more you have your antennas out, you will notice. I mean, it always works. And so the answer, Danielle, is I don't know if it's from a blocked back, but let's, let's um, experiment. And the exercise I just told you is kind of the sweet spot concept, basic alignment exercise all wrapped into one. And the whole point of that exercise is to find a place where your horse says, wow, I feel aligned enough that my top line is now free to relax and be used for what top lines are meant to be used for, which is locomotion, right? Back muscles are meant to um, contract and relax and contract and relax. And if the horse does not have enough energy, whatever that is, not too much, not too little, mama bear. And if they're not aligned, if they're crooked, they can't relax their back. They have to hold on to the tension to hold themselves. So these exercises are are designed to take a horse who has a blocked back and unblock it. It will also take a horse that just doesn't have a blocked back, just sort of normal, and increase the elasticity and the freedom of movement. So that's how I would approach it, Danielle, um, to try to um, create as free swinging a back as possible. And that really is, I think it's, if I may boast for a moment, I think it's my specialty. I, I can I can make any horse into a noodle. <laughs> I'm really good at, at suppling and freeing horses' movement. It's what dressage naturally specializes in. So um, if you're in the you know, if, if you submitted a question, you're in the classroom, which is awesome. So with what I just said, go look even deeper, look up, um, search for stretching, look at the videos on posture. And um, yeah, and if you need more help, jump in, in the sweet spot, of course. Okay, so kind of related, let me play now um, a question from Elaine. Hi, from Wisconsin. I own a horse who is confirmationally built downhill. Uh, I'm wondering if you can help me by recommending some exercises that would help my horse improve posture and carry weight more evenly on all four legs. Uh, Thank you so much, Karen, for providing this opportunity for me to ask this question. All right. So, Elaine, another really common question that I get 
you've got a horse that's conformationally downhill. So we are not going to change the conformation. So no matter what we do, um, we can't change the length of bones, right? So that's going to stay the same. However, the good news, the good news is that um, posture is very changeable um, with any animal. I mean, we've seen this with ourselves, but horses also. And here's a fun fact. Um, horses do not have collarbones. So their shoulder blades are really, um, they're, the the relationship between the shoulder blades and the the chest, the thorax, the withers area is really changeable. They can hunk their shoulders way down and they can really stand tall. So there's a lot of possibilities um, to change how they move their shoulders. So getting that lightness on the front end is um, important and it's, it is possible. So there's some good news. So, you know, with, <laughs> with horses, it, you know, it's not what they have, it's what they do with it. So um, the whole point of dressage naturally is to help every horse be the best that they can be the most um, aligned, the most balanced, the most calm, trusting, understanding, willing, motivated, and free moving that they can be. And you'd be surprised at how um, horses with um, unfortunate conformations can end up doing, you can have a horse go Grand Prix who's built downhill if they're willing enough and they're free enough and there's no brace. And you can have perfectly conformed horses that are, are just useless. <laughs> if you don't train them, right? So um, I just wanted to start that out with a little bit of a hope. We can help them be the best they can be. And in fact, I worked with um, uh, someone who did cutting and had a horse that was really built kind of downhill and a little bit like how, you know, cutting horses maybe have to be. And she did some dressage naturally and then did a cutting uh, competition and said she got her best scores ever. So super cool. So that's what dressage naturally is not just for doing dressage. So um, Elaine's question is in the gymnastics category, right? She's looking for exercises to bring the horse more uphill. So I put that in a gymnastics category. So I'm going to answer it in a gymnastics way, but then I'm going to connect it to the question we just answered. So there's three categories of gymnastic exercises. There's exercises for flexibility, which creates suppleness. There's exercises that, um, for mobility, other, otherwise known as lateral work. And those exercises create straightness. And then there's exercises for collectability. And those exercises create engagement and carrying power. So in a purely technical you know, the short answer <laughs> is do more collectability exercises and collectability exercises are really um, transition related for the most part. So transitions between gates, transitions within gates, with quality, without, with clear changes of rhythm from one gate to the other. And you can do things like, um, like a classic transition exercise would be counting strides, get on a pattern, um, you know, five strides of walk, 10 strides of trot, 10 strides of canter, 10 strides of trot, five, five star, strides of walk and repeat until perfect. <laughs> you know, if you can do that, you've developed uh, some more engagement. Um, but, uh, and so also to do collectability things would be, um, you know, lateral work can help and decreasing size circles without decreasing any of the quality. So that's kind of a nutshell gymnastic view of it. However, uh, if you just take a horse that's built on the forehand and let's say, let's picture an exaggeration. Let's picture when he's like really plopping on the forehand, like heavy pounding front feet. That might not be your horse, Elaine, but let's just picture it. If I took that horse and just did transitions and did a million transitions, you could do a million transitions. They might not ever become lighter. So 
you want to make sure it you don't just go, all right, transitions are collectability exercise. Let me do that. Because if they're not straight, then they're going to be cheating a little bit in every transition. So you have to do mobility exercises to get them more straight. But some horses aren't flexible enough to do mobility exercises. So you have to do flexibility exercises first to get them supple so that they can bend, so they can do lateral work, so they can get straight, so they can do transitions. But some horses are so heavy on the forehand that the, they never become supple. <laughs> so you're in, this de- you're in this cycle of down the drain. So the biggest mistake I see people make with this is they just go direct line into gymnastics, but they don't take the time to find the sweet spot of healthy biomechanics for that horse so that when they're doing the gymnastics, the horse is already in as free moving a state as possible. Even if they're still downhill, they're free and they're light and they're in their optimal gait with you in neutral then you do the gymnastic patterns. So this is where I'll kind of defer uh, for Elaine. I hope she listened to Danielle's, how I answered Danielle's question, because that's what needs to happen first. We need to check. Let's take that downhill conformed horse and make sure today we can find the sweet spot. So gymnastic training takes time. You rarely get... um, more uphill the first time you do transition exercises. It's something that happens over time. You video yourself, you do three months of gymnastic exercises, and then you look at the video again, you're like, oh my gosh, look how much they've changed. (laughs) The sweet spot exercises, you can get a change in one session. Because the sweet spot, a whole idea of the sweet spot is today, what's the level of energy, level of relaxation, you know, what's the circumstance of balance where that horse is going to be the most and your adjective, Elaine, would be light on the front end. You might like, I want to feel that my horse is a little more light on his front feet. Or you might say that I feel a little push from the hind legs. I can feel the hind feet under my seat when I ride. That might be the antennas you have out. And you'll play with the exercise exactly how I described to Daniela. But you're going to be looking for adjectives light on the feet. And that's so important because the biggest mistake people make with gymnastics is they just go straight line to gymnastics and they start going through patterns and trying to, you know, there's nothing magic in the pattern. You have to do the pattern with freedom and with lightness. So that's for both of you. I want you to think sweet spot first, find the circumstance, just like I said with Daniela, then when you have that, like, oh, this feels nice, and he feels light on his feet today, that's the time that you go, let me try some transition exercises and try to stay in that sweet spot while I do transitions. Or I might go, okay, and now I'm in that sweet spot. Let me trot down the long side and do a 15-meter circle, and then I'll do a 12-meter circle, and then I'll do a 10-meter circle. Oop, that's the edge. I start to lose the sweet spot and then go back out again. And you start to do those gymnastics. Let me start doing some leg yields. Let me start doing some shoulder ends in that sweet spot. And that's going to give you the maximum benefit. All right. So Elaine, I hope that helps. And um, yeah. And again, if anybody wants help with any of this, this is a golden opportunity for you guys. If, if you're listening to this and it's September or it's March, check out the website, look for the sweet spot course because it's hugely, hugely help. They'll change your life. (laughs) I've done this for enough years now. I know it's going to change everything. All right. So we're going to switch gears right now. We're going to switch to um, questions about motivation. So we're going to start with, let me see, let me start with a question from Lisa. And well, let's just listen to Lisa's question. Hi, Karen. This is Lisa. I'd like to ask a question for your podcast about motivation. What are some of your favorite techniques that you use to motivate your horses that encourages them to offer up the movements with effort and with pride? So you're not having to have the horses do it because we're making them, but what you do to encourage them so they offer up the movement on their own. 
So I'd love to hear um, a discussion on motivation. Thanks. Bye-bye. I love this question. This is one of my favorite topics. Yeah, you can train your horse to do all these kind of cool things, but if they don't really want to do it, you're dead in the water. So the question of why should he is a great question to be asking yourself. So think about reasons why a horse might do what we ask them to do. It could be because we've set up a circumstance where it's like, do it or else. You know, it's the, the gun to the head kind of method. It could be, well, just because I said so. It could be because the other options are less pleasant for the horse. So the horse decides to do it. It could be well, because everybody else is doing it and we're doing it together, you know, and this is fun. It could be because he gets paid really well. He's like, I like how I get paid for this. <laughs> you know, he's motivated, there's incentive. It could be because it already feels fun to the horse. And it could be because the horse loves to do this sort of thing. So those are the reasons why a horse might do what we ask. And you know, as you can see, there's sort of a scale. And in training, I think there's a range. Hopefully, none of us are using the do it or else I've got a gun to your head method. But I mean, really, honestly, sometimes we have to have horses do things simply because we said so, because it keeps them safe in our human world, learning to come off of pressure, right? I mean, that's going to save them if we're leading them on the side of the road. They need to, they need to learn how to yield to the pressure because because I said so, because I don't want to get hit by a car, All right? Um, but, you know, so we want to be able to control some things, but then really we want to spend the rest of our life trying to get them to really enjoy it. I mean, at least that's what I want to do. I want my horse to feel like it's at least kind of a cool deal. At least he gets paid well. Hopefully he finds it fun. So what Lisa's is asking for is not just the, like, get him to do it, but how do we how do we get them to really feel that pride? And it is possible with some horses easier than others. And depending on if what we're asking them to do kind of matches what they kind of think is cool. But I've had some really big success turning horses around that I didn't think would be able to do dressage because they really weren't open to suggestion at all. And now they like, think that they're all that and they are demonstrating pride. So it is possible. So here's, here's what I noticed with my horses because I do dressage, but I also do stuff that I call silly horse tricks. So I'm going to use this example of my horse Solana because she's the one I just said. I didn't think she was going to do dressage. She's not open to suggestion. She's the kind of horse that when you ride and you close your leg, her first thought is to stop. <laughs> you know, oh man. And she's, you know, she's pretty strong will. But I noticed that when I did my silly horse tricks, like stand with your feet in the tub or go jump the barrel or, you know, push this with your nose or smile, you know, turn your lip up. Um, she was highly enthusiastic. In fact, she would like push all the other horses out of the way so she could do her little silly horse tricks. And I thought, wait a minute, if I just thought about how she was riding, I'd say she was like stubborn and blocked and unmotivated. But with tricks, she's very motivated, very, very motivated. So I thought exactly about Lisa's question. How do I take that into, um, into the dressage training? Because I know Lisa does dressage and she also does horsemanship. So, um, what I noticed, the things that helped Solana get really excited, you know, what was it about the tricks that was different and how can I bring that into my training, my dressage training? So things that were tricks were, um, number one, listen how I described them, silly horse tricks, right? I'm lighthearted about it. You know, sometimes in the stuff that's connected to our sort of important goals, we get really serious about it and we have pressure and you know, we judge ourselves and then there's silly horse tricks. Like, I don't care. I just do them because I, they're fun. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, well, maybe I should make sure 
that my dressage, my serious dressage training is also lighthearted and fun. So I looked at myself, how was I interacting with my horse when I'm doing silly horse tricks versus how was I interacting and what was my attitude during my very serious dressage training? <laughs> All right, so keep it lighthearted. Then what's different about tricks is usually they're isolated. Usually we're standing around and then we go do this thing and then I give them cookies. <laughs> Right. So it's not like in a in in dressage training, there's often a lot of moving around. There's a lot, it's it's we're going, we're getting in the flow, we're getting them in the zone, we're loosening them up, and then we do some stuff, and then the ride's over. Well, with trick training and my silly horse tricks is like we stand around and then they do something, they get cookies, and we do something else, they get cookies. So maybe I can bring that into my dressage training. The other thing with the trick training I found was that it's really clear like the horses know when once they understand what it is like they get it they know that their foot's in the bucket or they know their foot's not in the bucket they know if they jumped over the barrel or they didn't jump over the barrel so there's a there's a degree of clarity that stands out much more when i'm doing tricks and they get they seem to get really excited about it like they'll run over put their feet in the bucket and smile at me like ta-da <laughs> you know a little thought bubble of ta-da over their head um people who have cutting horses you know horses that cut cows you know we see them doing cows doing the uh, horses doing this brideless uh, my horse monty once i was free jumping him and i was putting it up a little higher and he he hit the pole with his front legs and then he like took off and went around the arena i could barely get the pole back up again he's like let me at it and he jumped it again. And this time he just touched it with his hind feet. And again, he took off. He went around. I'm like, whoa, scrambled over there, got the pole back up just in time for him to jump it again. And this time he cleared it. And then he stopped and came over. I'm like, whoa, like there was a lot of personal pride attached to that. But it's clear he knew he touched it with his front feet. He touched it. He knew if he hit the pole or he didn't. So in dressage stuff which is inherently not clear, you know, oh, look, there's more cadence in your shoulder and, you know, horses don't think like that. They don't care about stuff like that. But can I make it so that it becomes that clear? Even if they don't really understand why that counter change of hand at the half pass, I especially liked, can I make my enthusiasm for their effort so that they go, whoa, whatever I did back there, like that was it because I do believe they start to pick up on this. They start to know when they really got it, whether they know it or they just know it from my energy. It doesn't really matter as long as they know it. They, they need to know what success looks like as clear as I put my foot in the bucket or not. Then what else do I do with tricks? I pay it really well. When I'm doing tricks, I have a big treat pouch <laughs> full of alfalfa pellets and they get lots of treats. And then they have some other little extra yummy treats that they get for when they did really well. And if they did pretty good, they get one little treat. And if they did really good, they get a jackpot of a lot of treats. And sometimes I have to go refill that pouch. Now when I'm riding, I do have treats with me, but not as many. So um, when I'm feeling like I need to boost their enthusiasm with something, I keep a little spare amount of treats nearby. Sometimes I'll have my assistant, I'll tell, I'll tell my assistant, Becky, I was like, if I know I'm going to do something a little challenging, I'm going to go, hey, I'm going to get on ovation and take a lap around the field. While I'm doing that, can you go hide some special treats in the bushes next to the arena? but don't let them see them, <laughs> but hide them. So she goes and does that. And so in the middle of a ride, if Ovation does something like extra special, I get off and I go, surprise, <laughs> treats in the bushes. Like we're, I'm taking you out for ice cream. And, you know, so that it, it <laughs> I think it works. He looks happy. So rewarding it well. The next piece, and this is an, a really important piece for the dressage part, is um, we have to build their strength and their stamina and their coordination. 
because with some movements in dressage, it's not going to feel fun or easy to them until they build up that strength. And here's the tricky part because we need to go to the gym. Um, anybody who's had themselves in training knows it's not always fun. You know, when I was training for a marathon, I hired a personal trainer because I needed someone to push me. Uh, and I would go to the gym and do weight training and, you know, doing burpees and push ups. Like, that's not fun. If he wasn't there and I hadn't paid to go, I probably wouldn't have done, <laughs> probably wouldn't have done them, you know, but I wanted to do them. So I had someone there to go, come on, one more, come on, you got this. I know, I hear you, but one more, please. And it's tricky with horses because horses didn't necessarily, they're not paying you to do this. Like they didn't even ask for it. So this is where our relationship, our rewarding has to be so good that we are able to get to a point where we can go, come on, come on, one more repetition, we're going to build some strength. And we can be clever in that when we build stamina, we do it out on trails or in fields and not just a million laps around the dressage arena. Um, but we've got to do some of that physical training. We can't just stop all the time um, because it's that strength and that fitness. I mean, I've experienced that. I've mountain biked, I've rock climbed, I've run marathons. Like, I know what it likes to be in training and to go through the hard stuff and get to the point where running 16 miles felt easy, like during a, a training session. It felt, it felt fun. I could sing, I could think, because I had put the time in to do the physical fitness. So that's the tricky part. How do we build the strength and stamina without just drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling? So get a little clever with how you build the strength and stamina, make it fun and interesting to the horse. And then along the way, making sure you're building the movements and treating the movements like tricks. So here's what I'll do with Solana or lots of my horses. After we warm up, I stop, I isolate it and I go, okay, when I pick you up, we're going to go across the short side and down the long side. We're going to do shoulder in 10 meter circle at E and then a shoulder in and then going to halt at C. Okay, here we go. And we do it. And I think of that as a trick. Now you could, that's a few things we could, you could just do shoulder in. So I think that's the trick. The trick is shoulder in circle, shoulder in, or the trick is canter pirouette, or the trick is serpentine with change the lead of trot through the, the, the middle. So if you start thinking of movements as tricks and you do it and then you stop and you assess, okay, how was that? Okay, thank you very much. Let's do it again. Okay, what do we need to do better? And then you do it again. And then when they do it really well, jackpot, treats in the bushes, get off. <laughs> and um, also, um, yeah, so, so the biggest mistake I think people make with dressage training where enthusiasm is lost is they just drill. They go, it, it's just like one, it's one movement. You start and then 45 minutes later, it's done. So in, in my dressage um, sessions, practice sessions, um, they, there's moments where I'm in flow, but then there's a lot of moments where I stop, I think, I do something, I reward, I stop, I think, I do it again, or I jackpot and go on to something else. And it feels much more like when I'm teaching tricks. And they get a chance to rest. So many dressage horses are made to keep moving. Don't let them, don't let them stop. Don't let them lose his focus. Don't let them. And then they just go into efficiency mode and zone out. Stop. Let them think. Let them catch his breath. Think about what you're going to do next. How are you going to do it better next time? Ready? Get set. Go. <laughs> and then you, it's like you can have 10 different sessions within your one session. And it's much more powerful mentally and emotionally and, um, and then again, put the time in physically. So um, for those of you in the classroom, in the video classroom, if you look at um, July 2020, Happy Horses Common Threads Parts 1 and 2, if you look at the Part 2 video, I have a chart, a PDF that you can download, and it's a list of all the different things that my horses love. So when I think about rewards, it doesn't always have to be cookies. There's lots of ways to reward your horse. Um, so take a look at that in the video classroom, July 2020, Happy Horse Common Threads Part 2. 
um, watch both of them. Um, but look at that chart. I came up with 60, um, I think like 69 or 60 something um, things that I can use as rewards for my horses. So if you guys can't come off at the top of your head, 60 something ways to reward your horse, you might want to go check that out. All right. So this dovetails perfectly into Tommy's question. Uh, so let's listen to Tommy's question. Hi, Karen. Uh, I can't tell you how much I enjoy your videos, uh, the Habits for Horsemanship course. And one of the things that I've struggled with is um, using food and treats. Um, my horse definitely needs it to be motivated. He's one of those low energy guys. And uh, anyway, and he gets so obsessed with food that he can't concentrate and focus. So how do I get him to respect my boundaries. Um, he's gotten better at it, but food is just used and treats is just used in so many of your training videos. And I just find that teaching him to respect my boundaries with food has been a real challenge. Um, so help. Um, that's my question. Hope you can answer it um, or give me some ideas on how to um, use food um, treats um, in a better way. Thanks. I love all your work. Can you keep me inspired even though I have struggles with my horse? So thank you for being there and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Tommy, for the question. I love the squeaky dog toy in the background. <laughs> I'm going to assume that what, that's what that was. Anyway, yeah. So you can see this question just is a really good uh, dovetails with the question just before. Um, yeah, super important. So one thing, she's in the horsemanship, Habits for Excellent Horsemanship course, and there is a whole section on polite boundaries and behavior around food. So Tommy, go look at that again. I don't know if you've gotten to that part yet, um, but there's a whole section in the horsemanship course about this. And in the video classroom, if you look at March 2018, Polite Boundaries with Food, and also January uh, 2017, Avoiding the Cookie Monster, um, there's a guest presenter who is an animal behaviorist and does a lot of positive reinforcement, and she talks about how to, how to do this. So those are some resources that are already out there. Um, but it's really important. I love using food, um, as you know. Um, but also, you know, like I said, that chart of the 69 things your horses love, um, look at that chart <clears throat> I just talked about from the last question, because um, there's lots of things you can use besides food to reward your horse. So you might want to check that out. Um, scratches, you know, there, there's 69 things there. So go check that out, because with a particular horse, you might want to take a break from food um, and look at some other things. But Food, I, because I want to use food, I want to practice this on purpose from the beginning. So I don't wait till you, I don't just use food and then, uh-oh, now there's a problem. I use their behavior around food as an exercise. So I will go out with a bucket of food, shake it in front of them, and this is the exercises they need to be, um, you know, have a, a nice way of acting around it. So one of the, my first and favorite things to do is I go out there, I have a pole on the ground, I have a bucket of food, they stand behind the pole, and I stand more than a horse's neck length away from them, and I shake the food bucket, and the game is that they have to stay behind the pole. So that's a polite, a polite boundary, right? And then when they do, I go to them and feed them their food. So them standing back, waiting politely, smiling at me, gets rewarded and I come to them. So they realize that that distance is what gives them the food. There's also um, a habit you want to have of rewarding a calm default behavior, right? So the calm default behavior might be, like I just described, standing at a distance, smiling at you. And then you can go with a straight arm, insert food into horse's mouth, or you can drop it in a bucket if you want, if there's a bucket there. Um, but if your horse, you have a rule, gimme, gimme never gets, right? So if they're coming towards me, if they're mugging me, if they're doing things like that, then 
what do you need to do horse? And they can learn that they need to back up. So if they don't know, then you back them up, hold, good. And then you go give them a treat or you just watch them. If they're, if you're around them and they're not mugging you, and they have a calm default, it could be a lowered head, whatever you want it to be, and you go, good, and then you go to them and insert food. So you just build this habit of the food comes to them when they're in this calm default, gimme, gimme never gets, right? And, and so you just have to have your own rules with your horses. Some of my horses get to cuddle me and snuggle and they're cute, and some especially do not, but they all understand this, so that if I go out with a bucket of grain, in their pasture and they all come around, I'll just wait. And they come up and they're like, look at me, look at me, look at me, I want a food. And I just wait. And maybe I go like this, I hold my hand up. And then they know they all start backing up. And then after they back up, I reward that. And that can be the default habit that they have. Backing up is the thing that gets them the treat. Backing up with their head down and a, and a smiling face, not ears pin, give me the treat lady. If, they, if there is pin, I go, I'll wait, I'll wait. And then when they relax and soften and put their ears up, then they get a treat. And this is something I practice all the time. They know to stand in, their, in the grooming stall and I should be able to go in the tack room, get their special treat, and they need to be standing out there smiling. And there's one horse, my horse who has trouble putting the ears up. Um, he's concentrating so hard. And so then with him, I have him go, here, go touch that little toy that's hanging on the wall. So he goes over there and he goes, I'm touching the toy. And he knows if he goes over there and touches the toy, then I will bring him the treat. So think of their um, polite boundaries around food as a standalone starting point exercise that you need to have in place before you start using them as treats. So since you've already been having this problem, um, step number one, go check out that PDF of all the different ways you can reward your horse, scratches, other things um, that you can use and take a break from treats as rewards for a moment and just go practice your polite, calm default behavior that gets rewarded and the polite boundaries get your backing really good. This means, you know, hold, I just hold my hand up, the palm out to them, and they know that's back up. If they don't get that, I wiggle it at them a little bit, and they know back up, and that when they're standing there backed up, then I shall come to them to give them food. So it's just a habit, and, you know, most people skip that part and just start using the treats and then uh oh now I created a problem so um, I hope that helps I do think it's worth it I love to pay my horses I love to pay my horses for what they do um, I pay them for for thinking not for being reactive not for being aggressive but I pay them for thinking and paying attention to me and being um, calm and attentive so I hope that helps you guys. Big topics. I know this went a little bit long, but I think it's so important. And um, the Dressage Naturally video classroom and the Dressage Naturally Sweet Spot course, you can find those. I'll put links in the show notes on my website page or in the details wherever you're listening to this. And um, um, yeah, it's a video classroom is available all the time. The Sweet Spot course opens in September and March. All right, guys. I hope that helps. Bye.